Um, I was really interested in Circle in the last few months, and I wonder if you look at it in some reference to ideas of generative programming and uh, introspection and, uh, and all the, it's, it's really exciting. And I wonder if you took ideas or, or if some of the top, uh, goals or aims of it you, you plan to implement in Carbon. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, we, we've definitely looked a lot at Circle. Um, we mostly have been looking at Circle when thinking about, you know, metaprogramming, as you say, like that, that seems to be where it's really exploring something. I think Circle shows a, a really compelling uh, kind of programmer model for how to think about metaprogramming. And I would love for us to have something uh, that, that feels as friendly. Uh, one of the challenges I think we're, we're going to uh, struggle with is how do we how do we take that very, very programmer friendly model that Circle exposes and combine it with some of the uh, build scalability and compile time goals that we have? Um, I just think there, there are a bunch of really hard problems we need to solve in that space. Uh, uh, and we, we actually uh, somewhat just put it on the back burner, not because we think it's not a good set of ideas or that we shouldn't try and solve those problems, but because we had too much on our plate. Uh, the, the reason you don't see a lot of metaprogramming in Carbon is, is mostly because we haven't been able to prioritize it, not, not because we aren't interested or aren't looking at things like Circle. Okay, um, great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really like metaprogramming. I actually do it at work and it's really, it's really, uh, it gives great results and, and I just wonder if uh, what its place in Carbon. Uh, thanks. Uh, I guess that actually brings up a, a, there's actually a hidden second question there that I'll answer before we go to the next person. Um, a hidden question there is what do we kind of imagine the role of metaprogramming is in the language design of Carbon? And, and here I think is something kind of interesting to look at because uh, if you look at, at uh, some programming languages, I think uh, Zig particularly exemplifies this and, and I think Circle is increasingly exploring this. Uh, they're what I think of as maximally metaprogrammed languages, where the language actively tries to stay very small and leverage metaprogramming for, for a lot of things that might be baked directly into the language somewhere else. Carbon is taking an interesting hybrid here. Uh, we actually think that there's a very significant value in terms of the developer experience to baking language features into the language. We can give a better developer experience, better compiler error messages, better integration, better compile times. Uh, and so we, we're trying to take this odd hybrid where instead of having kind of either a maximally powerful metaprogramming system that we use for as much of the language as we can, or a, a, a kind of minimal metaprogramming feature that we just try not to use, we're taking a bit of both. We want to have a maximally powerful metaprogramming metaprogramming system, but we want to use it as rarely as we can get away with, which seems a bit contradictory. But this, this really just reflects our idea that there's, there's a, a significant developer experience benefit if we actually, you know, take things and bake them all the way into the language. And so, so we do want to have the super powerful metaprogramming features for when we need them, when we know that users need them. But one of our hopes is that it's, it's not as pervasively needed as it, as it is in some other languages. And that's, I think that's an interesting different wrinkle in how you, how you approach the metaprogramming design space. Uh, but again, this is just very early discussions, right? This is, this is something that, that I think you know, has, hasn't yet been set in stone, much less, uh, or, or even really you know, uh, uh, filled in all that well. And so, so maybe, maybe all of this will change in, in, in a few years when we, when we start working on it. Actually, everyone who, who did the code generation uh, see the, the, I think what you're talking about, that the code that you generate you, is starting to be very big and you don't know why did you uh, um, generate it this way. So you really want it to be in, in, in uh, uh, um, language level mode because there the, the rules are strict and you understand it fully. So yeah, great, thank you. And we have a question, Ronan, do you wanna? Do you wanna... Yeah, uh, do you hear me? My mic is even worse. Yes, yes. 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 okay. Uh, two, two, two design decisions that you made that uh, I would like 
to understand better. First is regarding the syntax. You, you already mentioned that you try to get something that is easy, uh, easily possible, but it seems that you just uh, left out all uh, similarity to C++ in, for that. Isn't it a bit too much? I, I, Actually, I don't see why we are, we are discussing uh, carbon as a C++ uh, uh, continuation. It's so different. It's a diff different language. This, this is the first question. And specifically, one, one point that I think we, uh, there is a miss of opportunity to solve something that we are working hard to solve in C++, and that's the parameter passing. There is for example, the work that Herb Sutter did in D0708, uh, trying to uh, express, trying to be very expressive in what, why you are passing a parameter, uh, instead of just uh, uh, asking the uh, programmer to, f to know how to pass, uh, uh, what trick to use to pass a parameter in and out or whatever. It seems that you didn't improve on that, or am I missing something? And thank you for. Sure thing. Uh, so so, uh, let's start with the parsing. I, I do think this is surprising to a lot of people when they when they look at carbon. Um, I think the interesting thing to think about is when, when we're talking about changing just the grammar of a language, it can visually feel like this uh, is a very disruptive change. Um, but I think that may be missing something. Uh, when we think about when we think about uh, what changes we can make from C++ to Carbon, the way we think about this is how expensive those changes are, uh, right? And, and specifically expensive to the developers who were developing in C++ and are now developing in Carbon, and and have a large code base written in C++, and now maybe parts of it or all of it are in Carbon, and Changing the grammar is actually one of the least expensive changes we can make. And I want to talk about why. First, uh, changing the grammar has zero impact on interoperability, right? You have two different parsers. They don't care what grammar they use. Uh, and so, so your interoperability cost is zero. Um, migration. If, you want to, if we want to start building a migration tool to upgrade from C++ to Carbon, one of the only things that we know we can build a perfect migration tool is the correction and improvement of grammar. Because we have a parser for the old grammar and we know what the new grammar is and we can usually translate precisely from old to new. Uh, and so the, the migration cost is also essentially zero. Uh, very close to zero. The only thing that actually is difficult in migration are migrating comments, uh, where unfortunately, uh, that sometimes there's there's structure in like visual structure that the, the parser doesn't know is there and and has to work to recover. Uh, but it's very close to zero. This is the this is the least expensive thing for us to migrate of all of the things we might try to migrate. So the cost that's left is actually the human cost. And, and the human cost is real. When, when you look at the carbon grammar and carbon source code, it isn't going to look as, as like immediately like everything is the C++ grammar. And so we're trying to basically balance the improvements that we want to bring against this human cost. Um, but when we've uh, talked with, when we've talked with developers about this and shown them syntax, it's, it's interesting to note that humans can actually learn new syntax really rapidly, especially if the new syntax comes in a particular form. So if, if the surrounding context of, of code has slightly different patterns, but the interior patterns all kind of match the visual recognition that we use when reading code, it's fairly easy for humans to learn how to, to, to upgrade their, their visual reading. Uh, it's, it's a little surprising at first. Uh, so, so there's a sense of surprise. But if you switch from, does this look like C++, to asking, 
how does this work? What does this code do? Why is line 48 crashing? Uh, people are not, they, like the, the grammar change does not slow down how quickly they can answer the question, right? And so we think that the human cost here is actually uh, not zero, not at all zero, but probably affordable. Uh, and, and the benefits are actually really, really large. Uh, the, the parsing of C++ is kind of hidden how bad it is. Uh, uh, all of the C++ frontends in the world have had astronomical amounts of engineering investment in their parsers in order to cope with the grammar problems that C++ has. They are the most complex programming language parsers in the world. Uh, something that a lot of people don't know is how Clang parses C++. And it's, it's fascinating. It, it actually, uh, so the first thing that Clang has to do to parse C++ is it has the entire semantic analysis engine attached to the parser. So in order to parse the next token of C++ code, we actually semantically analyze the previous token. And we have to. Uh, it's not, the grammar isn't actually decidable without doing this. Uh, but that's, it gets worse than that. We also still can't parse C++ code. And so what we actually do is we will build ASTs. We will try to parse C++ code and, and build unbounded ASTs, try to semantically analyze them, discover that they don't make sense, throw them away, and try different parsing approaches. So it's not just a backtracking parser. It's actually backtracking with semantic analysis in the loop, uh, ASC, the abstract syntax tree, or, or the semantic model for what the parser has, has found. Uh, and and we, actually, we actually have to do things like do name lookup and resolve types in order to throw away parts of this uh, and, and resolve what the parser should be. Uh, it's incredibly complicated. And, and all of this complexity is part of why, for example, uh, almost every IDE either doesn't parse the most subtle parts of the C++ grammar, and you can't get things like code completion in them, or has to call out to an actual C++ compiler with you know, several person decades of investment uh, in order to, to get the, the grammar to work. It's, 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 it's just shockingly difficult. And, and these are the kinds of challenges we want to fix. We want it to be easy to write IDEs. We want it to be easy to write tools uh, to, to kind of uh, quickly and easily, you know, interpret the source code. And that has a lot of ecosystem advantages to the programming language. And we suspect that long term, it also has advantages to humans, because sadly, the humans are also trying to parse this, um, right? My and, and the humans struggle parsing it. My question is actually related to that. I wanted to ask about the tooling and the integration with IDEs. I know Clang uh, have uh, some way of integrating with Clang. I'm not sure if it's relevant to uh, Carbon, but I was just wondering how much Google is planning, or you know, maybe other communities are planning to invest in that part. And I think it's really important the tooling and the surrounding environment. Do do you have some estimation? Yeah. But don't don't so don't forget my second part. Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry. 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 My question sorry, is also is part related question. Um, because it, it has to do with the decisions that various compilers have made regarding the STL and how to avoid the issues where saying, well, this is performant with C G, with uh, GCC, but not performant with MSVC, and the other way around. Right. So okay. Like okay. Well, hold, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. So, so, so I'm going to briefly talk about the tooling, and then I want I want to get the second question repeated so that we can actually answer it, and then we'll get to to these these other questions here. Uh, uh, so, so on the tooling side, I think the important thing to think about is that that you know Carbon is still in its in its uh, 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 infancy, uh, and in fact we don't even know if Carbon makes sense. So, so it's impossible I think for anyone to predict the level of tooling investment that's going to happen because the, the tooling investment may be zero because the whole thing may be shut down because this doesn't actually make sense. Um, but certainly we we really want to be able to invest in good tooling and, and we want to have high return on that investment. And so one of the big goals in making tooling cheap is that you can actually start to build tools that would be too expensive to even bother with, right? Um, uh, the fact that it took uh, uh, just just an astronomical amount of uh, 
pressure and and necessity for us to start seeing real IDE support for things like automated refactorings in C++ is 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 a problem. It's not a, it's not it's not a feature that should have been early in the language's development. Uh, but we are going to see this for carbon for a long time because we actually need to understand the the reality of whether carbon works, how it works, who is interested in it, and then I think we'll start to see this. Uh, but I want to go back to the second question. Can you can you repeat your second question? Well, I was asking about uh, the what seems to me like a missed opportunity to improve on the parameter passing. Like, yeah, for example, what was done by. Uh, uh, in DEF 0708 or what, what other ideas regarding uh, intention instead of uh, technique uh, for parameter passing? So the, I think this is something we're paying a lot of attention to. Um, and and I, I kind of mentioned this, but it was quite brief in the, in the C++ North talk. Um, we are trying to specifically have uh, a, simple, a simple and really compelling model for parameters. Uh, we want to have kind of a, a pretty obvious mapping from what your what your kind of intent is with your parameter to how you pass it and we don't want to have some of the false choices here where, where you have to choose between a const reference or by value based on like well i think this this type is small and fast to copy i hope i'm right but maybe i'm wrong and if i'm wrong i you know it works but it's expensive we don't want this, and so we have a uh, uh, we have these like we make value parameters to functions, uh, kind of always good for inputs, right? Uh, because the compiler is in a great position to know whether it should use a const reference or pass by value, and so we we allow the the compiler to do that automatically. Uh, and for outputs, we're trying to have a simpler model because we're trying to avoid having uh, references and, and three or four different kinds of references in the type system. Uh, so you don't have to choose between them. There's just a single, a single model that you always use for uh, 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 kind of indirect access to the caller state. If you're going to mutate something, if you have a an input output parameter, uh, and it's always a pointer. Uh, the pointer isn't nullable, right? So you always know that it's 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 a pointer, right? And and there's no like you don't have indexing on that. If, if you want to do indexing or arithmetic, you use a different thing here. So it's this really simple construct that, that is reliable and always works. And for pure outputs, we're trying to make multiple return values much more convenient than they have been historically. So it's really easy to just uh, always use return, uh, always use multiple return values for output parameters. And I think the result here is going to be that there's, the, there's a, a very simple mapping of, of intent to how do you do this. It's something we are definitely thinking about. Okay, I think uh, we'll move to Avram, then Andre, then uh, Yehezkel have asked the question in the chat, and then Shahal. So Avram, go ahead. Yeah, so um, one of the things that I have encountered quite a lot is the difference between the optimizations that one compiler makes versus another, um, since the goal was definitely, sounds like, what I'm hearing a lot is performance. How do we make sure that um, different implementations for different uh, platforms remain with similar performance for the exact same code? Uh, just as a, as a very sure. simple example, uh, MSVC uses a thread tool for SCB async, whereas GCC doesn't. I, I think there's a there's a there, there are a couple of factors here. Um, so so on one hand, I think it's actually good that vendors can specialize. Um, I understand there, that sometimes it goes badly, but in, in for example, the, the HPC world, uh, the ability of vendors to specialize for their customers and what their customer needs has been incredibly valuable. And I don't want to take that away or, or, or pretend that that, would, that should stop happening. Uh, I think that the real problem comes when uh, you are on some platform and the, the platform's compiler uh, is, is just uh, really, really inadequate in some, in some regard. And, and you have code that feels like it should be should be fast and, and have good performance on any platform, but for whatever reason on this platform with this tool chain, uh, that doesn't work. And you need to you need to use something specialized to get good performance. Um, that I think we can solve. And one of the ways I think that we can solve that is actually by having uh, a, a really high quality reference implementation. Uh, 
I don't want to only have reference implementations. I think having the ability to have multiple implementations is very important. But the existence of a reference implementation, especially a high quality one, can be useful for really pressuring other implementations to kind of pull themselves up and hit some consistent bar uh, and make sure that at least some constructs are really uh, consistently performed, like high performance across platforms. Uh, and, and this has been hard for C++ because there isn't really a way in, 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 in the way C++ is structured as a, as, a, as a language, there isn't really a good way for the community to work on a, a designated, like, yes, this is actually our reference implementation. And, and while it's, it's, it's awesome if you have a, a vendor specific one that, that specializes for, for good reasons, uh, if, if you don't at least meet what the reference does, that's gonna be a problem for users. Uh, but we don't have a good way of doing this right now. And it's definitely something that Carbon wants to have. I think there's a lot of utility that we should be able to capture there. Thank you. Uh, Andre, go ahead. Uh, okay, so as uh, one other uh, attendee here previously commented, I find it a bit hard to see the relation here to C++. I think it's basically yet another new attempt at creating a better system language. Uh, the one innovation that may create something to C++ is the uh, stated goal of this kind of interoperability or uh, facilitating easy upgrade to, uh, to Carbon. Um, so first of all, things need to be cleared. This is a new language unless you can show more of a relationship to C++. And secondly, I would suggest a different way of approaching this, although it might be more difficult, which would be something akin to the .NET model where you have an ecosystem of different languages which can just cohabitate on an ongoing basis without any aspiration of, of uh, converting code from one language to the other. You have to have a common ABI and tooling and so on, but that would be much more powerful. So, so there are really two questions here. Um, so the first one, uh, the the entire framing we're using is a successor language. And that is a new language in many ways, but it's very specifically, uh, uh, very specifically oriented around that interoperability. So, so, so interoperability isn't, isn't a small thing. It is the thing. It is, it is the, the entire thing. Our effort is entirely focused on the use cases of people who have large, existing C++ ecosystems and for whom those ecosystems are not going away. People who do not have that problem have no reason to use Carbon and we don't want them to. We would like them to use the existing languages because they're great languages out there. But there are people with these very large C++ ecosystems and they struggle to use these other languages. Uh, and Carbon is an attempt to give them an option that, that might actually work. And, and for those people, you know, we have lots of them, but we are not the only ones. Uh, for, for folks with these large C++ ecosystems, that interoperability is, is night and day. That is everything, right? That is how this can be interesting at all. And that's actually where a lot of our focus is. So I wanna be very, very, very clear. Uh, that, that is absolutely where our focus is. I hope that that kind of clarifies why why like I like we're not trying to not be a new language. What we're trying to be is is to fit into the successor role, where where we have the interoperability. Now now we could think about doing something more like a a, a .NET uh, CIL uh, uh, kind of platform. But to be honest, we don't know how to accomplish that goal. Uh, and, and I want to be specific about the challenge here. Uh, CIL does it by lifting all of the languages on top of a common abstraction layer, right? The CIL, and and it's and it's very effective, but it also comes at a cost. That abstraction boundary comes at a performance cost, uh, and and for for us, our C++ users are using C++ precisely because they cannot afford a performance cost. 
uh, if we don't want to pay the performance overhead of a, a nice abstraction layer, right, then it becomes very hard to actually have this commonality. It would require us to have a maximum performance ABI shared by every programming language. But these programming languages have different features. They have different constructs. It's hard to imagine how they would share an ABI. And in fact, one of our performance challenges with C++ is its ABI. Right? We want to actually change the ABI to get better performance. And that makes it very hard to, to kind of build up this uh, large body of programming languages that all have a shared ABI. And even with a shared ABI, I think, I think this is an often missed thing because with a shared ABI that essentially allows you to have a foreign function interface, right? Like to, to, to dispatch into another programming language. That's not real interoperability. For me, real interoperability isn't that I can call another language. I can call C++ from Rust. I can call C++ with J and I from Java, from Kotlin. I can call C++ from all of these other languages. What I really want is interoperability. So I want the actual C++ APIs to be available in, in a kind of intuitive, ergonomic, idiomatic way inside of Carbon. And I want Carbon APIs to be available in an intuitive, ergonomic way inside of C++. And I can't do that with just an ABI. I actually have to have language constructs move across that boundary, right? Uh, one of the interesting examples is we have an abstract base class in C++. I want to extend it inside of Carbon and then pass pointers to those objects back into C++ and have C++ do virtual dispatch through both Carbon code and then sometimes back into C++ code. An ABI alone isn't enough here. Right? I actually have to have the language features of, of inheritance and virtual dispatch in the programming language itself for that to make sense. And that's the level of interrupt we want in Carbon. Right? It's, a much, it's a much more tight coupling between the two programming languages. And I think trying to get that to three languages just wouldn't work. It wouldn't scale. Thank you. Uh, I'll read the question by Heskel from the chat because we have some uh, issues with his uh, microphone. So he asked me to. Um, so he asks, requiring types to define uh, what interface they implement seems to limit generics very much, as you can't uh, use all types with functions that take the parameter by newly defined interface, even if the type actually matches all the requirements. Do you consider it a non-issue, or is there other trade-offs in, in motion there? And uh, thank you. This is a great question. question. Yeah, it is. Uh, and so, so I think this is. This is a particularly interesting use case. Uh, and there, there are kind of two approaches here. Uh, so the first thing is, with generics, what we really want to do is uh, we really want to have the ability to type check generic code before it is used, right? Like, like, like normal code is type checked. And we want that type check to be definitive. We want it to be completely sure. Like, nope, it type checked when you wrote it, when we compiled it. It will not get type checked again. You don't have some error. You're not going to get a 14 layer backtrace of errors later on. And we have to have a definition of the interface to do that. There's just like, what else could we type check against, right? We, we don't have enough information. Otherwise, it's an information problem. And, and that's why the, the, the definition is there. But certainly, we could imagine doing something like structurally matching that interface. And in fact, that's exactly what templates do. And this is also why Carbon has templates in its generic system. Um, and so in Carbon, we're, we're expecting that you can have something that is uh, uses nominal conformance, is what we call it, where, where, where the type declares explicitly, hey, I match that interface over there. Uh, this is nice because it can capture a semantic contract beyond the signature of the functions. Uh, I can, mean that uh, you can use my type in specific ways. Uh, but we also want to have the ability to have templated generics that don't require that. Uh, it's, it is challenging. We have to wait until we see all of the code before we can instantiate things and kind of finish checking that everything worked out. Uh, but it does have these use cases for low coupling. And we also want to have the same thing that concepts as we got them in C20 uh, provide, which is some constraints remaining 
on how you use that template. And so the, the, the constraint part of generics is kept orthogonal from the template versus definition checked part of generics in Carbon so that you can smoothly move from a completely unconstrained template to a constrained template to a definition checked template uh, a generic where, where the constraints are actually checked against it and you can pick whichever position in here makes sense for your use case uh, and and this is it specifically because we do want to support some use cases around structural matching yeah. uh, there's even there's even another tool so uh, sometimes you, do, you don't want structural matching. That's not your goal. Your goal is just to use a generic with a type where, where the two never knew about each other. And so they were never able to provide a definition. And we actually have a third, a third tool available that specifically allows you to take someone else's type, and someone else's generic, and use them together. Uh, these are adapters. They basically allow you to uh, kind of complete that bridging step. So we really are thinking about these different use cases. We're just building fairly specific tools. Um, and, and those tools are motivated by the, the different developer experience points we want to preserve. We want to preserve the definition checking when we can because it gives developers a better experience. We want to preserve what's called a coherence. We, uh, but a good way of thinking about this from C++, we, we don't want undiagnosed ODR errors where you go to link your program and either you get an error and you don't know why, or worse, you don't get an error, but like it does something and you're like, well, I hope that was what I wanted. I don't know if it was. Uh, and we don't have that in Carbon, right? We can, we, we can check definitely at the time you build that, that it does exactly what you wanted it to or gives you an error that says why not and how to fix it. Uh, it also helps us with compile times. It helps us with scalability. There, there are a ton of benefits that we get from this. And we, but we are trying to think through all of the different use cases, make sure we give you the tools you need for them. Very cool. And I just posted in the chat, there's C++ uh, uh, zero X concept uh, idea that you're um, most people that are not familiar are most welcome to, to go in and dig in into that. Uh, Shahar, go uh, ahead. A good way of Sorry. A good way of thinking about this is we, we think that from a, a functionality perspective, we have a superset of C++ OX and C++ 20 uh, uh, capabilities. Yeah. Uh, they, they sometimes come in different names because we're trying to make sure they all, they all kind of fit together in a cohesive model, but we think we have a superset of capabilities. That's really awesome. Shah, uh, Shahar, uh, thank you. Here, I'm not sure. Oh, yes. Okay. Hey. Uh, so. I apologize in advance if my question sounds mean. It isn't intended as such. Um, you call carbon an experiment. That implies that it has success and failure methods. What are they? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this isn't even a mean question. This is this is a good question. Um, so so uh, the success is of course easy. If uh, if we, and when I say we, I, I, I don't just mean, you know, you know I, I happen to work at Google. I have a bunch of users at Google. I don't just mean those users, right? Uh, but if we, uh, the larger C++ community, uh, uh, are able to use Carbon to effectively solve the, the, the problems that we face today with C++, uh, for the long term, then it's a success. That part's easy. And, and there's some interesting nuances there, right? Like not everyone has problems with C++ that need solved, right? And so this isn't about every part of the C++ community adopting Carbon. That's not realistic and that's not that's not even really like a goal. If C++ is working perfectly for, for people today, then it's working. Uh, that, that's, that's great, they should keep using C++. So part of success is that there is enough people across the C++ industry and community that have serious problems using C++ to need something that solves them and that carbon is effective for them to to solve them right it's got to be both of those uh, so that's kind of the success criteria but there are a lot of ways this can go wrong right uh beyond just you know do people have enough problems with c plus plus i think i think we are struggling with c plus plus at google I, i've talked to a lot of people in the in the industry that are struggling with c plus plus and so it does seem like there are real problems there that doesn't seem like the challenge I think the real challenge is, is, is carbon effective at solving them? And is it effective for enough different parts of the community? 
Uh, and, and we don't know the answer here. Uh, I, think, I think time is going to be a big challenge there. There's a lot of technical work we have to do to see whether carbon can, in a technical sense, actually address the problems. And also a technical sense where at least some people can, can adopt carbon effectively, can deploy it effectively in their environment, can, can leverage it to solve those problems. Uh, and there's another uh, uh, risk. If, if only one, like if, if only Google or I don't know, only some other big company is able to do this, I think that also is a failure mode. I don't think any one organization is going to be interested in using carbon alone. Uh, I know that we are not interested in using carbon alone. It makes no sense for us. And so, so it's not just does this work for one group, it's does this work for enough parts of the community and the industry for it to make sense as a whole. Uh, now, what the exact metric, is it two or is it three or five or, or I don't know, 78? I have no idea what that metric is. That's actually, that's actually part of what we need to define is what will, how do we actually measure sufficient interest? Uh, I think that's, that's one of the hardest things. Um, but to a certain extent, you know, trying to figure out where, where we hit sufficient, I think is, is less scary to me at least than the question of, are, is it going to be greater than one? <laughs> Is it even going to be one or is it going to be, you know, zero? Uh, in some ways, I think that's that's the first thing that we have to answer. And then we start pushing beyond that and seeing if it's, if it's you know, uh, sufficiently broadly applicable. Okay. I would like to very, very briefly address the elephant in the oh, room. Oh, you're muted in ball. Oh. Um, there we go. Oh, okay, sorry. I just want to very, very briefly address the elephant in the room and uh, address the topic of C++ versus carbon versus rust versus whatever. At least for me, I think the most important thing and the thing that brought me to participate in, in C++ development and in general to put a lot of my time for it is the, um, you know, the will to find a really good solution, technical solution for a large group of people. I think, like, I don't think we need to address that as some kind of competition or ego, God forbidden thing. I think like we all, you know, we all, I think, aiming to provide the best tools for the largest group of people to be able to improve technology as fast as possible. And I'm pretty sure, you know, when it comes down to, I'm aware that, you know, there's some corporations and people in carbon, I don't think, uh, at least the way I see it, I don't think they try to push C++ aside. I don't think that's the goal here. So, yeah. Um, okay, I just want to say we don't have a Chandler for a lot of time, so let's try to be brief uh, for the next questions to be able to leave uh, time for as many people as possible. Uh, Elazar, go ahead. Thank you. And what I want to ask, I remember that uh, other languages said uh, that I have to try to uh, uh, replace uh, C++. I'm very grateful to have uh, a thing that I'm having a rope uh, uh, way and, and, um, out of and, uh, it could be useful for me. And I wonder how, how, how if you have a bootstrapping technique, uh, how do you think it would be uh, uh, the best for me to sell a uh, problem to management trying to make a decision about uh, uh, making a change in a program language? Thank you. So I, I... I didn't quite catch all of that, but I want to make sure. So I want to make sure I actually understood the question here. Um, and I'm sorry if there's a bit of noise. Uh, I have I have gardeners. Uh, the the question is how how do we actually kind of bootstrap making a decision, especially in, in any kind of corporation with management about whether whether the, the level of investment required to get onto carbon because it's it's going to be a lot is actually worthwhile. Uh, the I mean I think I think there there. Are, the key thing here is to have uh, uh, a multiple different checkpoints, right? You want to actually have a roadmap of vetting here, and, and you really want to try and, and scale your investments with a fairly slow start, so that you can build a pretty, a pretty comprehensive case before you're investing a lot from any one in one organization. Um, and so, certainly, this is how we're approaching it at Google, right? This is part of why we're reaching out externally early on. Uh, we don't want to wait until we've invested 
you know, too much into this direction to start having a discussion with the industry and figuring out whether this is something that makes sense beyond beyond ourselves. Uh, I think that the key thing to do is to be very pragmatic, to talk to your users and, and to actually have a very concrete understanding of what the pain points are that they actually experience and precisely how carbon addresses them or doesn't. Uh, and that, that is going to be the end statement. So the first thing is to understand the pain points. And the second thing I think is to really uh, take ownership of the cost. It's very easy to kind of create this unbounded burden for users by saying, we're moving to the new thing. You know, even if it's C++ 23 or 26 or whatever it is, uh, we're moving from Clang back to GCC, uh, wh whatever it is, right? To say that, but then to externalize that cost on, on your company. Uh, and, and from my experience, this both is more expensive and also uh, makes the cost be perceived as actually very high because it's very risky how much it actually ends up costing. Instead, I, I really encourage internalizing the cost. Have a centralized team that says like, no, 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 no. We are going to work with all of you to do this migration. And, and do some of it yourself. Like make sure that you have done the work that you're expecting the rest of the company to do. And you can be very specific and clear about what it costs and how you paid that cost, uh, because that's what's gonna build confidence. Uh, and then, then it's about focusing on incrementality and, and uh, not having kind of schedule forcing or, or dependency orderings and that kind of constraints, right? You want to allow each part of the company to move independently when it makes sense for them, when it's, when it's cost effective for them. Um, and so, for example, this goes to the interoperability design we have in Carbon. Uh, one of the key things in Carbon is it's not just that Carbon can use C++, it's that C++ can use Carbon. It's bidirectional. And the whole point of that was to make sure that any different part of the, the stack, any different part of our code base, any team can move when it makes sense for that team to move. Uh, because if we have if we have some kind of complex ordering, and it, you know, like bottom up or top down, and it has to move in that direction, we think those kinds of constraints are going to make it almost impossible to find kind of effective times where people can migrate. Right? Someone somewhere will have the migration cost be amplified by a, a just an untenable amount because it's a bad time for that team. They've got a launch coming up. What, whatever their constraints are. It'll always be a bad time and you'll never make progress, but having it be super independent, very incremental and in small increments, very fine grained increments is the thing you can use to really minimize that cost, maximize the flexibility of how you, how you adopt increments. But you have to start understanding the problem and having a value proposition. How do we fix a real problem that users have, right? And you have to have a very, a very concrete understanding of what those incremental costs, and then you minimize them and, and you fit them into the schedule that they work. And when you have that at the end, that's the compelling case. I think addressing the migration is one of the brilliant uh, things that Carbon is doing because it's really a hard topic. Uh, okay, we're gonna ha we're gonna try to have the people that didn't ask questions first. So, uh, and then we go back to the ones that have. So, Alex, go ahead. Uh, you're muted, uh, Alex. Oh, uh, I, is it better now? Okay, uh, I have a, a very small question, actually. Uh, all other questions were asked before. Uh, you were speaking about uh, uh, the fact that uh, ABI is not enough uh, for good interoperability. Uh, inter interoperability, yeah, okay. So, uh, we have uh, this model of LLVM, the IR. Uh, LLV, uh, do you see it as a not enough for uh, the we level of interoperability that you need for carbon to succeed? Or uh, is it uh, not uh, good enough in terms of that it is uh, uh, C-length specific or uh, whatever. Yeah, I, LVM's IR is, is is very similar to an ABI 
in this regard. It, it is it is certainly necessary, I think, to have the kind of interoperability we need, but I don't think it's sufficient because it's it's too low level. It's too it's too close to the machine. Um, it, it's not about it being overly Clang specific. Uh, it, it's just that it's too close to the machine. You need a higher level of interoperability. By the time you fit LLVM, right, types are gone, inheritance is gone, all of these things are gone. You're loading function pointers and calling function pointers, right? You, you need a higher level uh, model in order to really hit the interop. Well, there you have uh, all these interceptors in between, in the middle that uh, uh, do all kinds of transformations and uh, uh, operations. And uh, to my understanding, they, they do understand uh, inheritance and uh, things like that, maybe. You need some extension for uh, IR. Not really. That's not, that's not really how they work, though. Uh, so, so they, they they are aware of, of 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 specific pieces of inheritance, right? But only the pieces needed for very low level optimizations. They they don't have enough information to really be operating at the type system level. Uh, it's 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 been lowered beyond that. So we just preserve these tiny nuggets of information in 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 LLVM's IR, just tiny pieces, in order to make very targeted optimization transformations. And what you need for interop is actually the the original the original truth, uh, and, and that that's basically gone. Thank you. Um, Abigail, go ahead. Or maybe someone else. You're unmuted and then muted again. Yeah, my daughter uh, took control of the Zoom and I wasn't uh, able to switch the name back. Um, I, I have a question about optimizations, uh, potential suge suggestion for a value proposition for uh, carbon. Uh, as far as my experience goes, uh, there are two major reasons for missed optimizations with C++. There is pointer escape analysis and there is pointer aliasing. And uh, with regards to aliasing, uh, C++ uh, 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 devised the TBAA, uh, I, I mean, uh, strict aliasing with regards to pointer escape, uh, not so much, but Rust came up with borrow checker. And um, uh, as a user, I submit to you that uh, this is a pain point. I'd like better optimizations. And uh, this is a rare op opportunity. If you create a new language, I went through the documentation and couldn't see an indication of, uh, of, of new stuff in that front, but uh, was it considered, was it discussed? So we are, we are thinking a lot about this. Uh, uh, and there, there are even some things we're thinking about it at a higher level. Uh, so, so one of the things that we're hoping for that we see a lot of potential in optimization is around call-in conventions. So, so some of the value-based input parameters is, is specifically targeting that. Uh, we actually have looked pretty heavily at aliasing and, and the improvements there. And the, the improvements there are, are kind of weird. So there are definitely these kernels, these very like, tight loop kernels that benefit from better aliasing information. Um, and, and I'd love to see us have very localized tools to enable that. But we don't see kind of broad cases across like like large bodies of code where the aliasing information is is going to be as useful, and so so we're not we're not sure they're going to be kind of systematic advantages from aliasing. Uh, we think targeted approaches may work very well there, um, but escape is something that we see more systematic approaches for uh, systematic benefits for, and so we are actually hoping to introduce uh, uh, an escape uh, an, a pointer escape. Uh, check to make it explicit uh, which pointers are actually escaped and how much to the extent we can. Uh, uh, it hasn't been a priority, uh, mostly because we want to get to the MVP. We want to get to the thing that allows us to evaluate, uh, can we make this interrupt work? Does the interrupt work really, really well? But we're trying to leave some very specific uh, holes in the language that we believe we can fill in uh, with with uh, some optimization benefits like this. Some of them we have to front load 
uh, parameter passing is really important to front load because it has these knock-on effects. Uh, we think that the escape stuff we may be able we can add later, and so it's definitely something we're thinking about uh, uh, as we go along. This could be a major selling point for me uh, when talking to my management in my particular organization. Thank you. Thank you. Vladi, go ahead. Uh, there's a lot of interest. <laughs> We hear you quite weirdly. Can you do you want to try again? You hear me? Or now it's better. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I, I have this weird mic. I, I wanted to ask about the status of this project. I think you you mentioned you had some users within Google, but like so. Like, what's the largest program, uh, the largest application that has been written using Carbon at this point? I mean, uh... no, 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 no. We have no users at all. Uh, yeah. uh, you can't write an application in Carbon. So the status is we are just getting started. Uh, so we are still finishing the design, and and once we finish the design, we still have to finish uh, a demo implementation, and and we've only just started writing a. a some, a real implementation as opposed to a demo implementation and 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 that that is uh ha, has a whole world of work to go there no 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 we're, we're much earlier i wouldn't expect us to have uh, uh the ability to even do you know very small evaluations right like little test programs that are really running completely independently until next year um, and i wouldn't expect an actual application like a, a real world application for a couple of years or more. And even then it'll be limited and, and really in an experimental phase until we're confident in this direction. We really don't want users to adopt or migrate to Carbon, only for us to set, come back to them and be like, actually, this isn't gonna work. You have to go back to C++ now. Like that's a very bad experience. And so we're going to be fairly conservative in having our users adopt it until we really feel like we've done the evaluation, we've done our homework and we're, we're confident in the direction. Yeah, like not, not operational users obviously, but like the size of demos, but uh, okay, uh, I got it. And a small question, uh, compile time programming, like a const expert equivalent or uh, like, is it planned to be in the language or? Absolutely planned. Uh, for us, that's 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 a, a core part of what we think of in terms of metaprogramming, and it's definitely something we're interested in, uh, and, and hope hope to be kind of exploring in the future. Cool. Cool. Thanks. Um, okay, we'll go with Roman. Then you uh, you add uh, uh, you okay. love, sorry, and then uh, Shaul and Ronen, which I see are very anxious to ask questions. <laughs> so go and ahead. Those will probably be the last. Yeah. And I'm sure. I'll, I'll the more questions people ask, the more questions rise. So maybe Chandler will need to have you back, you know? Uh, hi, Chandler. Um, thank you very much for meeting us. Um, I heard um, all your, I was listening to all your answers to uh, the people who are asking, and uh, I got this uh, vibe that you intend that the language should be kind of medicine to the existing problems in a very large corporations with the existing code base and uh, where you need like to uh, handle uh, those code, code bases and you think about carbon as a medicine uh, to slowly migrate those code bases uh, to the new language. Uh, do you think like, uh, would you fantasize about people starting absolutely new projects using Carbon? Uh, of course, uh, right? People will, will, of course, start new projects using it. Uh, it, it when, when I focus, I mostly am focusing on kind of our priority, right? Uh, uh, the, the thing that is a unique capability for Carbon is going to be around large code bases. And I do want to be clarify one thing. I don't think it's just large corporations that have large code bases. There are large code bases all over the place. There are large open source code bases shared between small corporations and even individuals. 
their large corporations, it's their large uh, code bases, it's small corporations that have been around for a long time. Uh, but but I think the large code bases are are what is unique, that unique opportunity. Um, but of course, it is a programming language, but it also has to support new development. Otherwise, it's not going to be very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Yudav, go ahead. I hope I say your name correctly. Hi. Uh, yes, Yudav. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, which type of uh, program uh, application you think carbon, carbon will be uh, best suited for? I don't know, maybe uh, uh, where you need the best uh, <coughs> uh, results, like, I don't know, gaming or something else, or where you don't uh, need like fast uh, response, or you say, or you're planning that Carbon will be also faster than uh, C++ and like in everything. Uh, which direction do you think it's more suitable or where you plan to take it? Absolutely. Um I think that the, the, the key criteria for carbon to be successful or, or most successful is how, how tightly you depend on, on high performance and complex C++ code. Like if your application, if you even have a small code base, but you use boost pervasively and you don't just use like the surface of boost, like you use all of the advanced features of boost. Uh, or, or some other very complex C++ features, and and those are maybe those are maybe third-party libraries that you, you can't migrate to a new language, or or your code base is large enough that you know you can't migrate all of it um, at once. I think that's that's where C++ is going to be the most effective uh, because of the uh, Carbon is going to be the most effective because of the interoperability because of how it can be incrementally adopted. Um, because it can reach out to those existing complex C++ APIs. Uh, if you have, uh, instead, a very, uh, a very strong abstraction boundary, right? you have a core of small core of C++ code, and you depend on a bunch of other C++ code, but the APIs you use are very strong abstraction boundaries. They're very simple APIs. They might easily fit, let's say, in, in, in a C foreign function interface. Um, I don't think Carbon has a strong of a value proposition there. Uh, there are lots of languages you could use there. If you don't have tight performance constraints, you could use Go very easily there. If you have very tight performance constraints, you should use Rust, uh, maybe. Um, right. The, the, the interesting thing about Carbon is when you, you work very, very closely with very large C++ uh, code bases, large C++ APIs, and, and there's not this strong abstraction boundary you can take advantage of. Uh, that's, that's, that's when it's gonna be a huge factor. Uh, there was also kind of a question around performance. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are really confident we can match C++'s performance. Uh, as was brought up, I think there are gonna be specific places where we can actually provide uh, a, a value proposition with better performance or, or a, Easier optimizations, uh, easier for the for the programmer to make certain kinds of optimizations. Uh, certainly, better data structures. I think are something we're going to provide out of the box. Uh, and so, I think we're not going to see regressions from C plus plus, and we want to give you opportunities to even improve on the performance. Thank you very much. Go uh, one thing I should I should be oh, super sorry. clear though, right? If if memory safety. And safety in general is is the top priority for your software. Please don't look at Carbon. Go go rewrite it in Rust. Uh, it's it's expensive. It may be almost prohibitively expensive, and it's still worth doing. Um, we are we desperately want to get memory safety into Carbon, but it's going to be a longer and more difficult road than than what you have with Rust. Uh, and it's because we're trying to bring a large body of unsafe C++ code along the road along that road, and that's just going to be a very long, very difficult road to go down. Uh, if you don't have to, you shouldn't. Uh, there are great safe languages that you should use today if you can. Our whole focus is like, you know, I don't, I don't care about how many safe programming languages or unsafe programming languages there are. What I care about is how much unsafe code there is. And unfortunately, at the moment, I have a very large amount of unsafe C++ code. And if I can make that a little bit less unsafe, 
or, or, or a little bit less of that code, that's going to have real, real benefits to users and real benefits. And so that's, that's where Carbon is focused, right? But it's a very different focus from, from what Rust and others are doing. Uh, it's a very different strategy from what other, others are doing. And I don't want to paper over that. I don't want people to be confused about that. I just want to say that in the poll prior to your, uh, uh, your, um, uh, that you came, uh, we had a, a poll about memory safety and around 61% of our group uh, was uh, thought that this is an important topic. So you might want to pull it up your, uh, <laughs> your issue list. I mean, no, I'm just kidding. It is something we, we care, we care a lot about. Uh, uh, I don't want you to think that we're not caring about this or not thinking about this. The entire question for us is, you know, the code that, that we don't have to kind of migrate from C++, uh, we're going to put that into Rust. Of course we are. Everyone should, right? Because it can get to memory safety immediately. This is all about what about the code that if, if you just tried to move it to Rust, you wouldn't succeed. And instead it would stay in completely unsafe C++ forever, right? How do we actually make that code better? And that's where Carbon's trying to make a difference. Uh, and, and to the extent we can get some memory safety in there, we're going to invest a tremendous amount of effort to do so. Uh, but we want to make sure that we actually get the code uh, as well, not just the language design. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, so I, I actually have a question related to that. So, and since I haven't asked yet, so uh, if yeah, you're uh, stepping into line. Um, it's a very short question to ask, but I fear it may have a longer answer. It's about this total interoperability. Um, and Hiram's law and undefined behavior. And the combination of these three give me a, a, a sense that in total interoperability, even migratability is, is kind of difficult to say with sincere face. Or, or, I mean, you can have the good intention, but something will have to break between something without UV and something with you, something without Hiram. Uh, Hiram's law, if you've never heard about it, it's Whatever users can use, they will use, regardless if you declare it public or not, or if you document it. Or not. So, that, that was this is a good question. Um, so, I think the, the the key thing we want to to allow people to do is to uh, address the practical problems they discover because of Hiram's law when trying to interoperate. Right when they discover, oh gosh. You know, I've moved this API from C++ to Carbon. You know, I thought I, I exported a compatible, like, you know, interoperable API back to C++, but now these three C++ users of the API don't work anymore because they relied on some bizarre unintended thing, right, that, that went away in that migration. What we want to do is give you enough tools to be able to address that within your Carbon code. Uh, and we're giving you a lot of tools to do this. For example, we're giving you templates, giving you inheritance. We're going to give you the core things that C++ also provided. We're also get, thinking about escape hatches on day one. And so we're thinking about how do we allow people to inject actual C++ bridge code into their interoperability layer to, to reconstitute some C++ oddity that their users accidentally depended on. Um, and and we're, 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 we're largely planning to do this. We're going to have a way of basically embedding bridge code as you need to. Uh, I'll give a concrete example. One of the things that, that I think is scary at first, but easily solved. Uh, a classic way that Hiram's Law bites you is your C++ code included a bunch of headers, right, in your header. And, and you migrate this code into Carbon maybe, and because you moved it into Carbon, you used a different set of data structures, right? And you didn't need to include the C++ headers anymore. But the users of this API, in addition to using the API, they also were silently relying on the headers that you included. Uh, and now they're broken, right? Um, and unfortunately, maybe these users, you can't go and fix those users. Uh, what we think we can do is allow you to inject bridge codes so that your, your exported C++ uh, interface actually still has the header includes that people were relying on actually still has this, you know, it's unnecessary code, but you can actually like meet the users where they are, right? Like, this, you know, that's, that's what you needed. So now it's, now it's actually going to match your expectations. Uh, and, and you can still make progress. 
uh, right? It can warn users or, or, or like let them know like, okay, you get another year, but you have to like, please stop using this header file that you just picked up through hours that doesn't, that's not sustainable. Uh, but you have tools to address this. And I think that's, that's the approach we think we can take here. And it doesn't actually burden carbon with as much technical debt as, as I think you might imagine, because we can really push those tools onto the C++ side of the fence, right? We can have really strong boundaries between these different, these different worlds and just have an interoperability bridge between them. Okay. That's awesome. I think how much time do you have? Because I think uh, we can I go, can probably on go for two hours probably. I, I could probably go for another uh, five or 10 minutes. Okay. So um, who's up on the list? Uh, Shaul. Uh, we we'll do this shower on in, and then if we have time, we have another question on the chat, and then we we'll just, yeah, just a small final, question. Of course, C plus plus uh, promotion, uh, and then we can see. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, just a small uh, question about uh, development uh, experience uh, about compilation time. Is it a goal or how this going to be? Yes. I'm obsessed with compile times personally. Uh, and so, so uh, having better compile times is definitely like a, a larger goal of carbons. Uh, but I'll also just admit that like I have a very, I have a very personal stake in this. Um, I am incredibly frustrated by compile times and it's something that I think we can, we can make better, uh, just, just tremendously better. Uh, uh, my, my current goal is that I want us to, to uh, have basically all of the compile time be an LLVM. Uh, and then, and then we'll have to go and fix that to make the compile times even better. Uh, but I think there's there's a ton of headroom here. I mean, I mean, there's just there's just so many things we can do to make uh, progress on compile times. I think we're going to have uh, just just a, a remarkable a remarkable difference when we get to kind of a modern and really well designed and well implemented world. Uh, okay, right before mm -hmm. our next question, there's a question about the uh, picking of the name carbon. Would you would you mind share with us uh, where did the name <laughs> came from? <laughs> uh so so everyone i think everyone on the team has a different origin story for the name carbon at this point which is kind of entertaining i don't know quite how we got there uh that's the best, at least uh, my, best way <laughs> my origin story at least is uh we actually had a bunch of other names we had a whole poll from and like we asked a bunch of people for it and there was voting and we had a bunch of options and um, to be honest, like like half of them were terrible options. I'm sorry, they, they were well intended, but they were awful. They weren't they weren't very good. Uh, and and we had some really good ones, and we like started asking the 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 like the official people, which means often the the lawyer hat people, uh, uh, about them, and they kept saying like, no, you can't use that one. No, you can't use that one. And we ran out. And we actually completely went through all of the ideas that we had for the name, and and we were like, well, I guess we need some more ideas. I were like looking around, and uh, one of my favorite named projects ever is Mercurial, um, like that, and like the use of HG for for their command line, like they just won. Like like two my two favorite names of open source stuff is Rust and Mercurial, and so we we literally went through the periodic table, and we were looking at like short, easy to pronounce names of elements, uh, and and we stumbled across carbon. That's that's really it, but like the puns are great. I love all of them. I love the puns about carbon footprint and like should you really be working on carbon? I love the puns about like carbon and rust and like metallurgy and chemical stuff. They're all great. All the puns are good. I wonder how many how many carbon jokes you already have. But <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Eddie. You, you said. I think Conan is next. Okay, a uh, hypothetical framing uh, question. In the in a better word, if C++, in a parallel world, uh, if C++ would have adopted the idea of generations, or even better, if it was go the governance was moved outside of ISO, would that uh, made the uh, carbon uh, redundant? Would you have stayed with? Uh, that's a great question. Um, while there are a lot of really like specific data points we can point to for like this, this was a signal that that it was worth exploring carbon. 
uh, uh, there was the ABI discussion with the committee. Uh, th th there have been there have been a bunch of other discussions as well. I mean, the ABI was the last of a five-year series of discussions and votes and debates within the committee um, that involved distilling the question down to something really precise. Uh, but there was a whole world of questions that preceded it. All of these are interesting data points that did send a clear signal. But it's hard to imagine that any single one of them going the other way would have would have would change things. Uh, I feel like it would have to have been some large collection of differences. And to a certain extent, from my perspective, it would really require C++ to have a, a completely different, uh, not C++, but WG21. Uh, I don't want to say that. It would, need, it would need some evolution process that was both a completely different process uh, and also a completely different priority, right? We need to have a different set of goals for the evolution process itself, for how they want to evolve. And, and, and then all of the things that would need to change to align with those goals would also need to change, right? It's, it's not like just new goals would, would be sufficient, right? It's about goals and, and not them being new, but them being baked in to how everything is working and how everything is happening. And, and there would be a, a, an incredible series of changes that would need to happen there. And that's part of why carbon started to be interesting was because we realized we weren't asking for a change, one change or two changes or three changes. We're asking for a completely different approach to developing and designing a language, right? Uh, one focused on not stability, but uh, migration and upgrade and tooling. Uh, one focused on a rapid open source process, one focused on performance, you know, never regressing performance, but incrementally providing a better developer experience, better safety, uh, better language environment. Uh, all of these things were coming together, and that's why it made sense to even explore Carbon. And keep in mind, we don't know if Carbon makes sense yet. We know that it makes sense as an experiment, but like, there's a real question that we do not have an answer to yet. And that answer may be, this is not worth doing, right? At the end of the day, this may just not be worth it because it's incredibly high cost. Um, but I don't, I don't want folks to think that there's this, that, oh, if we had voted differently on topic A, or, or you, you mentioned uh, if, if it weren't part of ISO. I mean, each of these things seems interesting and seems very motivating. I don't want to downplay them, but I also don't want them to be viewed as, as singular because I don't think that's realistic at all. Right, it, it, it's a collection, and they're all related to each other, and they're all related to the priorities and goals, and and how everything is aligned around those priorities and goals. And I, I just want to Thank very you. quickly add that I think just having more languages, just having more such projects, is a great thing. Uh, you know, languages are being affected by each other, and it's not that we need, you know, one thing that will replace a, a different thing. I think. Both C++, C++ can learn from Carbon as much as Carbon can learn from things that C++ did uh, greatly. So, you know, it's not, I don't think that there's only a single room at the top and we need to concentrate and, and, go, and go there. Um, Andre, have, uh, if you still have time, uh, Andre, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, very uh, short, very short question. Uh, Go ahead. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this has been addressed, but are you aiming for ABI compatibility with C++? And if not, how would you deal with uh, with interoping with uh, uh, closed source third party libraries, which are already a big uh, headache today? Absolutely. Uh, I... Our, our expectation is that we're going to have uh, uh, so, something analogous to two tiers of interop fidelity. But we know that we will have to have a tier that interrupts with existing pre-compiled C++ code using its existing ABI. That, that's a clear use case, uh, but we don't think we can get all of the fidelity that we would like there. And so we also want to uh, 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 provide a higher fidelity uh, environment when people can you know, recompile the code with, you know, uh, a customized tool chain with a customized standard library that expands on that fidelity. And we've actually already explored what this looks like. Uh, you can already take, you know, code that was compiled by, you know, an ancient GCC or, or some other compiler against libstud C++, uh, some old compiler using libstud C++, 
and uh, use that with today's Clang and lib C++ and even lib C++'s unstable standard library ABI. And, and you can combine these two, and it's OK. You just have to be very careful how you move from the, 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 the code that is recompiled into the precompiled code. Uh, and we think we can roughly match that in, in uh, that kind of experience in Carbon, where there will be a, a speed bump when you go into the, the precompiled code, but we have to give access to it. And, and we, think, we think we can give access to it based on how our experiments with Clang and, and similar situations within the C++ world.